Good afternoon, ladies. Okay, so on being a giver, that's the topic for today. Um, <coughs> I don't believe this group will find anything um, novel about uh, the ideas that I'm going to share today, but I suspect that there are going to be some chidushim that you're going to walk away with, and uh, hopefully you'll have a deeper appreciation of what it means to be a giver. So now let's start with the following. It says, Im tzidkata mati ten lo o ma miyadcha yukach, right? If you're righteous, what do you have to give him? What does he receive from your hand? Which basically means that if you're someone who is a uh, looking for righteousness, you're living a life of righteousness, you have nothing to give God. So, so what is God able to receive from you? If you have an infinite being that has everything, infinite means I have everything, what are you doing for God? Why are you being righteous? What is What motivates your actions? So now, at the core of what we are is that we're animals with a soul, or we're bodies with a higher purpose, or the soul that has a, has a deeper desire to do great things. And therefore, at the core, if we examine what we are on our subconscious psychological level, we are all motivated by one of two things, giving and taking. This is at the core who we are. We're givers and takers. Every single person can be broken down in the most simplest terms do these two categories. Is this person a giver or a taker? I think we all know what it's like being around takers. And we definitely recognize the beauty of being around people that are givers, right? Now the question is, well, what is the ideal state to be in? And why are we created in these states? Why are we created as givers and takers? What's the function of being a taker? What's the function of being a giver? I think everyone would agree that if you're in a relationship where you're only giving, that's bad. Right? And if you're in a relationship where you're only taking, that's also bad. <laughs> so what does that balance look like? Where do we find, how do we create that balance within ourselves? How do we figure out when it's too much to give, when it's too much to take? Well, how do we find that balance? What motivates the giving and the taking? So God says, Let us create man. How? Let us create man in our image, in our life. He comes down into uh, the... Um, he will uh, rule and conquer over the fish, everything on the planet. Man is created in the image of God. What does it mean to be created in the image of God? God has no image. How can you be created in something that doesn't look like anything? Right, you heard this question before. What does it mean to be created with Tzalem Elohim if God has no Tzalem? So good. So we're talking about his attributes. So is there a specific attribute that we're speaking about over here? So um, it's very interesting. It says, look closer over there. It says, Right? What was the likeness that he created? It says later on, God created man. So what does the word Elohim mean? Why doesn't it say B'Tselem Hashem? Why doesn't it say B'Tselem Shakai? Why is it say B'Tselem Yud Kei Vav Kei? But it says over here specifically B'Tselem Elohim. What is unique about the word Elohim? Number one, the word Elohim is plural. If you want to do a literal translation of the word Elohim, what does it mean? Gods. Well, what does that mean, gods? We believe in G-O-D, not G-O-D-S, right? So what does Elohim mean? So the word Elohim means Baal HaKohot Kulam. It means the power of all the forces. And therefore, we are created in the image of God that represents his power to build and create, his power to uh, build and destroy. That is the image, that is the likeness that you and I are created in. Now, the truth is, is that if we left our natures as is, without any laws, without any kind of government, without any kind of morality, what would society look like? Chaos. Complete chaos. Why? Why is there chaos? Why can't we have a system of order? But why? I know you need rules. Otherwise, like, you would do whatever you want. Why? Oh, that's the point. Meaning, like, what does it mean to do whatever you want? Just... If you want something and I want something, what's the problem? We'll fight over. Exactly. Who says that your want, your need, is greater than mine. 
Who says that? Who says that your want and your need is greater than mine? And therefore, if we just leave it to our own um, machinations, we'll end up creating chaos because everyone always believes that their need is more important. That is the default setting. Boundaries are important. So laws, by the way, this is why in society we need laws. Laws create the boundaries necessary to keep order and civility. Look at this next source over here. Look at number three. Perek Yavot, Rabbi Haninya, says, right? Hasagan HaKohanim, the vice Kohen said, Havi mitpalel b'shlomo shel machut, you should pray for the welfare of the government, she'il male mora, because if it was not for the fear that inspires ish of chaim bo'o, right? If it wasn't for the fear that it inspires of the government, every man would swallow his neighbor alive. Chaos. We would destroy everything around us so that we could take what we want. That's how powerful this emotion, this drive of taking and needing is, right? So it's, a, so it's taking a, a selfless gene or a selfish gene? Taking. Yeah. Ah, so it depends. But at its core, you would argue, I think you could argue that it's really about yourself, right? You're always taking, it's always very, very, very selfish, right? And you see that, look at what look at Shlomo Melech says, number four, he says, Oker beto botzea betza batza besone matanot yichye. He who pursues all kinds of uh, gain makes trouble for his household, and he who spurns gifts, he who hates gifts, will live long, right? Sono, sone matanot yichye. So here you have a verse, that someone who hates receiving is gonna live. And I think that's very simple. Like if you're always reliant upon other people and you don't know how to be self-sufficient, how can you survive, right? If you don't know how to make yourself dinner, if you don't know how to make yourself lunch, breakfast, you don't know how to boil water to make yourself a tea, you're in trouble, right? We need to learn to be independent, right? I've been saying this, I've been thinking about this idea a lot. Is it better to give your child the money they need to buy a house? Or is it better to teach them how to make the money to buy their own house? Number two, everyone agrees. Why is that better? You'll appreciate it. You have a gratitude, a sense of ownership, a responsibility. When you get things for free, you know what happens? You don't appreciate it, you squander it. And then you expect more. And then you expect, and it's endless. You, can't, you have to keep paying. So what you end up doing is giving this child the money. What you really just did is turn that person into a charity case. That person never, never does not know how to fend for himself, does not know how to provide, how to build, how to take responsibility. All now he knows is feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me. That's the nature of a human being. And therefore the chachamim, and you'll see by the way, by the end of this conversation, what should happen, it did for me a little bit, is that you'll begin to appreciate why the, the, the saints, the righteous men and women of our people were always so, they always, they always created a massive distance between them and the physical things on earth. Not because there's no value in the pleasures of life, have those things, but just be mindful that yesterday's luxuries are today's necessities, that the things that yesterday that I had that were my luxury, the special heated seat, I can't buy a car without one now. And now they have heated steering wheels, which are even better. <laughs> Right. You know, help them, you know, with the furniture or then paying off things and then they want to add an addition or whatever. Not only is there no gratitude in many cases, there's actually resentment from the person who gave it to them in the first place, which is such an interesting right. twist of 
human nature when it's not grounded in understanding because it, development. One hundred percent. Like you're angry at the person who helped you in the first place. It's just crazy. Because you know why? Because you, they realize on some level that they're trapped. That now they have a certain standard that they need to live Ooh, on or, or a standard that they need to live by and they can't maintain that standard. So they're mad at the person who got them to that level. They resent that. that. Yeah, I can't keep that's this. I, and that's where the frustration, Thank you. Thank that's, you. Where the, that's where the, uh, that's where some of that stress and resentment comes from. So let's keep looking. Let's look at number five. So this is a quote from uh, Bereshi. It says, "Vitalech Chanoch et Elokim," and Chanoch, right? He's walked with God. What does that mean? That Chanoch walked with God. Look at number six. Midrash tells us. By the way, those of you that are listening, I'll post the uh, link to the source sheet in the video. Um, it says a uh, number at the top page two. E- Enoch is a cobbler. And with every single stitch that he made, he achieved mystical unions with his creator. Now, what does that even mean? So he sewed and he made shoes. And every single time he stitched the fabric of the shoe, he connected to God. What does that mean? Does that mean that there's like, that shoemakers are, are very holy spiritual people? Right? I, I don't think that now, now, now remember that lahalacha, when you're doing your job, you have to have your mind focus on the job. Right, so it can't be that he was like, oh, st- stitching on a subconscious level and being conscious of God. That's not what it means. That's what we're, we want to believe it means, but that's not what it means at all. The Chachamim say that this is talking about an individual who connected to God by giving the best of himself. When he was doing his job as a, as a cobbler, he made sure that each stitch of that shoe was tight and perfect. You know, some people, they do a job for you and it's like like a half job, you know what I'm saying? I don't have to say the word, right? It's a half kind of job, they don't do the whole kind of job, right? Now, that person is not expressing the best of themselves. And therefore, when we think of ourselves for a moment, when we do the work that we do for the people around us, are we giving 100% of ourselves to that action? Or are we doing things chetzi chetzi? We're doing things, you know, kaka. I'm not 100%. I'll do it because I got to do it. That, is, that was not, that was not uh, Enoch, Chanoch's greatness. Chanoch's greatness that when he did something, he did it 100%. Right? So, um, the famous story of, um, of the Chafetz Chaim, who was a, um, he opened up a grocery store. Right? This is not that long ago, 125 years ago. He had a little makolet in Raden, which is a city and a town in uh, Poland. And um, he would make sure that he would, he wanted to get the best produce. So he found the farmers, he would inspect each produce that came to the store and he would sell. In a very short period of time, everyone in town knew that this guy went to painstaking, you know, uh, uh, time, spent painstaking efforts into finding the best produce. Everyone went to him the best oranges, apples, watermelons, whatever he had you knew it was good because he spent that effort into finding the best. So what ended up happening, his, the other stores in the neighborhood were getting killed in business. No one wanted to go shop with them anymore. So what did he decide? He's like, I don't want to hurt the other stores. I'm going to reduce my hours. I'm going to open up for only two hours a day to give other guys opportunity, you know, this way I'll make it. I don't need all that money. I'm not making money to make money. I'm making money so I can have whatever I need, so I can keep doing the things that I want to do, the important things in life. So he closes the shop. He's only open two hours a day. Now there are lines at the store because everyone knows the two hours that he's there, it didn't help. It made it worse. You know what he ended up doing? He shut the, he, he shut the grocery store down. Did not want to compete. Did not want to compete. So what does he do? He ends up walking around selling his books. He wrote a bunch of books. He decided now he needs to, he needs to you know, uh, support his family. So he walked around from city to city in Russia and Poland to sell his, his books. Now, most people don't know this about him, but he would go out into these other cities and sell his books and pretend not to be him. He, 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 he showed himself off as kind of being like some like merchant selling books for the author, but he was the author walking around selling his own book. 
he was a very unimposing person. He was a short guy, a little cute, you know, like you would never see him and think like, when you think of the Chavetz Chaim, you think of this strong, big man, you know, with like, you know, fiery personality. He wrote Shmir Talashon, he wrote the book on Lashon Hara, he wrote the Mishnah Bura, he wrote all these amazing books. And you think he was this massive gaon of a human being. But he was a small, little, cute little guy that you just wanted to like pinch his cheeks, you know? And he was a guy walking around, selling his book, and like no one knew it was him. He was that humble. Look at, look at, look at the next uh, uh, Midrash. It says, it says, if you want to keep close the love of your friends, sorry, let's go to the one before that. Greater is he who benefits from the labor of his hands than he who fears God. Number eight, if you want to keep close to the love of your friends, make it your concern to seek his welfare. So what does it mean that greater is he who benefits from the labor of his hands than he who fears God? If you're able to fend for yourself, right, that's greater than fearing God. Because ultimately, we don't expect you to live in a reality where uh, you think God's doing everything for you. Let's, for example, let's double click on this week's parasha, okay? Abraham finds out that Sarah, the love of his life, is dead. He just did everything God asked. Sacrifice your son, your bachor, your oldest son, your only son. And, you know, why is he Avram doing it? God says to him, before this, I'm going to give you the land of Israel. You're going to inherit the land of Israel. I'm going to give you Eretz Israel, And I'm going to make your children into a great nation, as numerous as the stars, as numerous as the dust of the sand on the earth. So how does the parasha begin? It begins with Avram not having a place to bury his wife. There's no land to inherit. He's spending a fortune to buy the land. Did, where did, where did, what, what did God do to him? His son is 36 year old and still single, never married, alone. What happened to my name, this great nation? What does he do? In the parasha, what does he do? He goes out and he buys a piece of property for, to bury his wife. And he sends Eliezer, a shadchan, to find a shidduch for his son. He realizes that in order to make God's promises true, he has to put in the effort to make it a reality. This is the nature of the world. We expect miracles to happen for us. Oh, God, I prayed, I did all these things and that. Was, was Abraham resentful? No. No resentment. Exactly, you gotta do your ishtadlut. The, the ishtadlut is until you get what you want. And if you don't get it? Then you didn't try hard enough. Or maybe it's not meant to be. Really? So this is the secret. The secret is that no matter what it is in life, that you're interested in having, obtaining, you will get it. For better or for worse. You gotta be careful what you wish for. Right? En davar omed lefneharatzon. Nothing stands in the way of the will. Which means, no matter what it is that you want, you will get if you truly will it. For better or for worse. Right? That's why we don't will pushing a certain kind of date with a person. Because maybe it's not the right person. You do it, you push a little bit. But if you push a little harder, you'll get what you want, and maybe that's not the right thing for you. Which means what we're saying is that you could push at your hishtadlut to a place where you could get even that which you which is not good for you. That can happen. That's the power of your free will and your free choice. Yeah. What would be? Is there anything possible in, in figuring out what your will you want with what is best for you? Well, yeah. I mean, I think that um, it's hard to do it objectively for yourself. Can you? How do you know what's best for you? Um, you need a mentor to help you with this. You know, someone who knows you, who understands what the goals are. It, when it comes to dating, is the person gonna is the person gonna help you be the best version of yourself? Is that person gonna elevate you? Is that per, like you know what's the is it just a superficial relationship? How does a relationship express growth in both of you? You know, like there's all kinds of litmus tests that we can put into the system to figure it out. But if all you're doing is pushing and using your bichira for superficial external things, and it's not about your growth and development, if it's only about taking, you're in trouble. <laughs> you're in trouble. The question you asked before yes. you listen to your will. You know you want something. Yeah. So you need to have a certain set of questions that are really introspective to say, okay, I want that, but 
the tactile and to be an expression of me becoming a better version of me and also being better for the people in my world. You have to prioritize the things that are different. Hundred percent. You have to prioritize, but you guys, it's all about it's all about creating a strategic understanding of your development. Remember that greatness comes from you living a life where you're expressing the best version of yourself. That's where real simcha comes from. That's where real pleasure comes from. Everything else is counterfeit. Everything else is shekir. It's all fake. What's real? You know what's real? When you overcome your struggles, that's real. When you push and fight to become great, that's real. Everything that comes naturally easy to us is, 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 is nice, but it is a distraction. Our default setting is do what is easy. My default setting is I don't want to work hard. My default setting is I'll do it tomorrow. Let me ask you, you're, you're, you're in a relationship with your wife, with your family. Let's say you have a will yeah. and you ask those questions, what's the best version of me? And she has her will and she says, what's the best version of me? Where did that meet in the wholeness of everybody? Who, you know, where? Because ultimately one call can be made. I think you're asking that because one one person's you know um, direction may be in a different direction. Is that what you're asking? I mean, like, it means like ultimately you make one decision. Let's say you want to move to Israel, she wants to stay there. Okay. Right. Tension is that will be the best place for me and then my family and us. I, I, and she's saying no. You know what? We're here because she's not here. The children are driving. They're never back. It's funny. Israel is the only example, which is not a fair example, because lahalacha. <laughs> you're allowed to divorce your spouse so they want to go to Israel. So like it's the, yeah, that's how powerful Israel is. Um, but anything else, but anything else where it's not so, yeah. So like I want to live in Woodmere because there's an amazing synagogue there. I like the prayer, I like the rabbi, I'll grow there. And where I am right now, I don't feel a connection, right? And maybe she has her community. And he has, or she, whatever, has something here and then and he wants something over there. So that is a great question. This is, again, this goes back to the giving and the taking and the relationship. Right? Who's the bigger giver? Who's the bigger taker? Who needs it more? Are you there? Is it just for you to take from your synagogue? Is it for him? Like who, who, who needs it more? Uh, there's so many. That's such a big conversation. Again, that would be a mentor conversation with the rabbi. This is why you need to have a guide who's looking at where you both of you are spiritually, and kind of like understanding where each of you are coming from. And then, then with that information, we could take both sides of the story and come to some sort of a. Uh, <laughs> in, in, in amicable, you know, conclusion that makes sense for, for the relationship. But there's never going to be a scenario where it's equal. There's always going to be a situation where someone has to give something up, a sacrifice, if you will, for the relationship. Right? And you, again, like, the nature of a relationship is that in every relationship, there's always one person who's giving more and one person who's taking more. Right? It oscillates. It changes. It's true. Sometimes it changes. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes just there's a constant. Sometimes there's a constant. Look at the look at this next source. It's actually fascinating. It's in Devarim. So there's a halacha that um, if you see your enemy's donkey lying under its burden, right, you have to help the person. Okay, that's that's the number ten. That's in pasuk in Shemot. Ki tirech amor sanecha robetz tachet maasa vechaldata mazovlo azov tazov imo. Do whatever you can to help that person. We have an obligation to be proactive, help those people that are in need. We need to become givers. Look at number nine for a minute. Now, these are three examples that Torah gives of things that, um, that, um, that would absolve an individual from going out to war. Okay? Right? Tell these uh, officers the following things. You built a new house, right? And um, you uh, did not live in the house. You did not do a Hanukkah to buy it. You don't have to go to war. A man, right, that planted a vineyard, right, and he did not go ahead and uh, 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 did not redeem it, then uh, he does not have to go to war. A man who got married but not consummate the marriage, that person does not have to go to war. What's the commonality over here? The commonality of all these things over here is that ish asher yikachna, Right? These are all examples of people that created something that have not benefited from it. These are each examples of individuals who have, um, are in a state where they've put effort into something and did not benefit from their actions. So we see a tremendous need that human beings have for justice's sake 
that they first have to be able to benefit from the things that they have. So there is this idea of taking from the world. I'm not saying you should live a selfless, aesthetic like life where you have no connection to any kind of uh, physical things. The Torah is saying over here that no, there's certain scenarios where we're afraid that if the guy, you know, we want the guy to experience these things and therefore he, he doesn't have to go to war. We want there to be a sense of fairness and justice. We want his needs, wants to be met, right? But at the same time, we also know that we're supposed to be proactively looking and thinking about the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, objects uh, of, uh, of uh, the people that are around us and if they are in need of help, then we have to do everything we can to help that person. So the Gemara and Baba, Baba, Baba Metziah, right? And it gives two cases. One, if it, you see an animal who has a uh, heavy load and the animal has fallen, there's a mitzvah to help the owner to reload his stuff. The animal falls, all the stuff falls, you see that happening, stop what you're doing, doesn't matter what you're involved in right now, you have a mitzvah to be the giver in that situation. You help that person, you give to that person. Scenario number two, over or an animal where the mitzvah is twofold, right? to prevent further suffering to the animal, therefore help him take off some of the load and to help the owner to load it more effectively. Now, if one is confronted by both cases at the same time, the second one takes precedence since an additional mitzvah is involved, helping an animal. Now, if one is confronted by two specific similar cases, but in the same one instance, the owner is a friend, and in the other, the owner is an enemy, you have to help your enemy before you help your friend, because there's a specific mitzvah to help one's enemy. Why? To conquer your yetzer hara. Not, your, it, it's, it's, it, that, it's that specific. You have two scenarios, they're both about helping. Which one comes first, your friend or your uh, the stranger, the neighbor, or even your enemy? Help your enemy first, because the purpose of life is to overcome your base nature. What if it's the perception of the friend? The friend has to be on this level to comprehend, wait a second. Even if it's two people, let's say, I would say, let's say you see oh, you know, a, a person that's more familiar to you and you feel more comfortable with versus a person you're less comfortable with. You would have to help the person that you're less comfortable with. It doesn't have to be such a, like an enemy, like an enemy, my enemy, yeah. you know. Uh, it could just be what you're comfortable with. And so therefore... Why you over I, uh, That's like a very technical question that I don't want to have on yeah, tape. Okay, so, <laughs> but, uh, but... Um, it's a question, like, what if somebody, you know, your family member is very negative and, like, you just avoid them because you feel like you're around them. Like, so should I overcome that and go and sit with them even though they even feel... Yeah. Because the reason why you don't want to go there is because of the way it makes you feel. And therefore, your feelings take precedence over that relationship. And that's you kind of like surrendering to being part of, being in this like equilibrium state. And who says that, that we're supposed to be in that, that's that? By the way, that's not what shalom means. You think that shalom means being like comatose, avoiding pain? Shalom means, but that's, but that's not peace. That's being a zombie. That's being a, uh, you know, uh, part of the apocalypse, the zombie apocalypse. That's not about, you know, living life. So how, so, 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 how, so what's the growth there? What, so, right, so the, so the question is, what's the function? The function is not to sit there and just to take the pain either. The, it's, to, it's hopefully to get yourself to a place where you're comfortable to either deal with the issue and move on, so it's no longer an issue, mm. right? Not it's the idea effective. that that I'm. What's that? Not to be effe- exactly, not to be affected exactly, not to be affected by the circumstance that you find yourself in. Like that person wants to pull pull you to the negative, and you're trying to keep that balance of equilibrium and, and learning and elevating. And the other person is not in that space. You see, a person just whatever you will to enable them to stay in that state of mind. It, it, they won't see it, and they want to pull you into their. Yeah. Is it, you can't, that's a taker. That is. That is a taker. So, that, so, so I think this is this 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 conversation is important because yeah. I want you to get yourself into a place of dividing people into these two categories. Okay. Right. Why? Because every child is a is what a taker or a giver. It's like a big combination. Every child are, are all one hundred percent pure, beautiful takers. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We, we want them to, they give, but not because they want to give. They're giving, they're giving in a very, very selfish way, 
right? They smile because they want something. <laughs> They'll hug you because they know that they're, they're brilliant at, at creating the illusion that they love you, right? But at their core, everything they do is for themselves. And that's beautiful. That's why we love kids because it's so innocent. It's not, there's nothing, there's nothing, there's nothing you know, nefarious about that want. Right. There's something innocent and beautiful about it. So we love that, you know, we find it cute. It's obvious. It's right, it's obvious. So at some point, I find that part of becoming an adult is recognizing that some adults are really just still children. And therefore, when you see that someone who is an adult who behaves in a way that's inappropriate or that's whatever, frustrating, and they haven't grown and they didn't have the courage to come up and step over. And when you do, you just you should feel great that you graduated and that person did not. not I feel bad for the person that he did, they did not. But just like a child, you wouldn't be insulted by a child's behavior of being just a taker, a taker, because they're children. And unfortunately... I'm saying you should be there, but the frustration comes from the fact that you think they're an adult. But if you, if you recognize them as being children, as being immature, unsophisticated, right? Unfortunately, right? You won't be as, you, it won't bother you as much. Okay. The problem is that we give them, oh, well, this is my yeah. uncle, right. or my this, and this, and they should know better. But they obviously don't know better, and therefore, you're children, you're a child, I'm not, here I am. No, but it's so important. It's such, it's such an empowering idea when you start recognizing that that you've grown as a human being, and these other people are still stuck. No, so true. Wow. But it's a negative stuck. I don't know why that is. It's not like a, a children in the least playful. Listen, there are plenty of adult, plenty of adults that just get stuck. But the, the ones who know that it's more like all their pain that they've gone through. The reason why. It out. The reason why what I found, and I'm certainly not wise enough to know with certainty, I'm not old enough, I think, I'm, I'm, my sense is that most people that are older have um, a picture of the, of, of the world that is based on their own unique experiences. Yes. And those, those experiences define their reality. And they can't escape that. That's what it means to be old. To be young means everything's possible. There's no fixed scenario. There's opportunity everywhere. But as you get older, you don't have this opportunity. It starts getting narrower and narrower and narrower. Why? They're all children. The yeah, opportunities, but because they've never developed themselves. So we're all they never developed themselves. It's painful to see it. I see it all the time with some of my older, you know, you know, friends, family, whatever it is, you know, like they're just stuck. And you can't undo that, but believe me, I know it's true because this has been my experience. You can't tell me it's different. I'm like, it is. It's different. It's so you just keep yourself like in a positive state and interact with them for long term. I mean, I try to try to do my best. You know, like it's when it comes to family, family's tough. Family's really hard because it's so personal. But you can't allow your ego to get in, in the way of the bigger picture of things. God forbid something happens. You want you don't want you want to know that at the end of 120 you did the best that you could in the circumstances that you were in, period. Yeah, it's never going to be perfect. And, you, and it takes two to tango. I'm not saying you should be shmata and give endlessly, but be bigger than the scenario you are. Don't allow it to, don't, don't give over the power to that person to make you feel uncomfortable in your own skin, in your own environment with your family and friends. That's what I'm saying. So listen, look, let's look at, um, so uh, we said we had lo, lo to come, right? So it says over here, lo to come. The ultimate goal is to recognize that you should not take vengeance, you should not bear a grudge against your, your fellow man. You gotta love your uh, you should love your friend Kamocha, the way in which you love yourself. This is a beautiful idea. I Kamocha, why? Because the same way that I take care, I take care of myself, right? It's the same way I need to take or give to you. That same effort. That's what it means. It doesn't mean I have to love you. It means I got to care for you. How do I care for you? The same way I care for myself. I'm worried about every single moment that I eat enough, that I drink enough. I'm, I take my. I got to care for the people around me in the same way. And the more that you're able to feel that sense of care and responsibility for the people around you or the people closest to you, the more you're able to build that love. We say in Bereshit Rabbi, he who has no wife, 
is not a complete human being. Why? Because ultimately we believe that when you're in a state of um, happy, healthy relationship marriage, in that environment, when you have two people who are able to continuously give to one another, that is the greatest expression of human humanity. That is a great expression of being a giver, great expression of being godly. That's the greatest expression of what it means, what God wants from us as human beings, right? But all too often, like most relationships, they always begin the same exact way. Okay, number one, no one's in love when they get married. Sorry, it's not romantic. No one is in love when they get married. Sorry, I know. Was I in love when you got married? Was I in love? You want me to be completely rationally honest yeah. with you? No. No, I was. I was infatuated a little bit, oh. but not in love. Okay? There's a difference. To love means to want to give unconditionally. Were you in love? Think about it like that. Are you ready to give unconditionally to someone? You know what the answer is? If you want to be honest, no. And if you are, you're in trouble. If you really feel the full weight of love at the beginning of a relationship, you're in trouble. No, no. Why? You, you tell me. Because then it will fade away. No, really think about it. No, 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 no. no. If, if to love unconditionally, to love means unconditionally. There's not, there's not such, such a thing unconditionally. That's why no one, that's not true. There is with time. I had like... There is with time. There's, I, I love my wife unconditionally. But how is that the, you know what I'm saying? Like, and, and therefore... Is even like when that yeah, they do. she cheats on you? No, no she cheats so on me, you have to break her legs. You know what I'm saying? But like, <laughs> <laughs> no, why you have to like no, 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 no. So no, so you're right. So uncondi- there's always going to be something, but like a, a barring cheating, okay, 99% of anything else, I'm not worried about. It's unconditional. But how, how come that's and I want you to know, the only, the, a person cheats 99% of the time because they're not getting what they need in that relationship or out of that relationship. So everyone's somewhat responsible for something like that happening. But there's, there's, if someone's cheating in a relationship, there's other, there's other issues, right? It's not, that's not the issue, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm telling you, when two people feel this unconditional desire to give to one another, right? It's because everything is there already. They're not, the odds of them cheat, it's, it would be a miracle for them to cheat. Like, it's like, that's how crazy it is. It's like, to me, it's, it's absurd. It doesn't make any sense. It's absurd, it's crazy. When you are in a relationship where everything is met, everything is there, you don't need to look anywhere else. When there are things that are missing, you're looking around because you want to fill the void, but no one, certainly no one feels true love when they first get married. So why are they getting married? I guess we could talk about the unconditional love as a parent to child. And is there any time you feel that besides over the years? Of- I, think, I think that even parent to child is somewhat limited. We don't feel unconditional there either. There's always me, even like a child does something, you know? You know, there are certain things they cross. You'll be, you'll also dis, dis, disavow them and get rid of them and so on and so forth. Older, no, nah, even with it depends. Even a child that's young, okay. you know. That there, 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 you see, the, the mistake that we make is that we think that when a child is born, that we actually feel unconditional love. We don't. I know you think you do, but it's not. Okay. I'm sorry. So, so no, I'm not saying. Let me, let me explain. I, I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying to teach you something important. Ready? Most reasons. When you lo- you love your bit, you feel a sense of responsibility for your children in the beginning, right? And you th- you you and, and you give to that child. But if, at that moment, if you looked at your kid when they were first born, that first day, it's not the same kind of love you have for them after 25 years of raising them, providing for them, caring for them. It's not the same thing. And I would say that the love that you have for a 25-year-old is a thousand times greater than your love for a newborn child. And the reason for that, the reason why it has to be that way is because love is developed through the act of giving itself. The more you give to something, the more you love it. The more effort you put in something, the more you love it. Now, why do most people get married? Most people get married. I'm sorry to all the single people listening to this. The reason why you're really getting married is because you selfishly believe that you're gonna benefit from being in this relationship. And if you didn't feel that way, you would not be in that relationship. 
but certainly it's not love. Now that's a good thing. I want you to start your relationship from a selfish place because I want you to know that you're taking care of the things that you need. You believe selfishly that you're gonna benefit from being in this relationship because if you truly love that other person, you would never want to subjugate them to your own deficiencies or insanities. So you don't love that person because you love yourself. And that's okay. Get it? Is it clear? No? Yeah. Maybe I'm too naive. I still believe, like, oh my God, you, you, you have to sit with your, your palms open and be ready to receive. If you sit like this, that means you're not ready to listen. <laughs> anyway, the idea, okay. the, idea is very, the idea is very simple. No, it's actually, it's actually true, by the way. When you sit with your palms open, you're more, on a, on a, you're more able to receive than when you sit like this. Like a, it's like a whole, it's actually, they did studies that show when you do at yeah, you're, more like you're more able to receive. You're more able to receive than when you're standing, what's it called? But anyway, that's part, 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 part of the, uh, how our, our physical actions impact our inner subconscious, okay? But the idea is very simple. Again, in the, every, every relationship starts from a selfish place. If you didn't have that, you would be infatuated. If there's nothing selfish about the relationship and it's selfless, you're infatuated, you're not thinking. And everyone knows that if you're infatuated, you're, not, you're in trouble, right? You're in a very dangerous place. I don't want you to be infatuated. I want you to be selfishly thinking about yourself. Now, most marriages, unfortunately, get stuck in this selfish mode where it's just about my benefiting from you and never about transcending that selfish gene into a place where I'm giving unconditionally to this other person. That's the goal of marriage. The goal of everything we just saw, everything we just read, is all about switching a person out of a place of being a taker and turning them into a giver. Now, I don't want you to have that desire to give unconditionally until I know that you have something else that's there. There's a vital ingredient necessary to make love a reality, and it's called commitment. That is what the marriage ceremony is about. The kiddushin, the nisuin, are all about getting the bride and groom to understand that all the love, all the feelings and the emotions are useless if you don't have commitment backing it up. No commitment, bye bye. no love. <laughs> no commitment, no love, no relationship, nothing at all falls, falls apart. Can a relationship uh, maintain itself from a, from, from a selfish place? The answer is yes, if it works. If, if, if it works for each person that we're selfishly taking the other, it can work for a little bit. But it, it never lasts too long. At some point, something is gonna break. You have to be at a place where each person is willing to bend towards the other and give them what they want. It can't just be about taking from the other person. Taking, taking, taking leads to a, a, a situation where you're empty, empty, empty. In order for a person to build love, there is a uh, story that, um, Rav Dessler says that during World War II, he saw there was, a, there was a, uh, a couple who had a child, one child, a son, and when the war started, the, um, they, they had a plan of where they were gonna go, right? They were gonna, set, they were gonna, they were gonna go meet at some place in the forest. The father took the son, because when the, when, the, when, the, when the Germans came in, they were together, and the wife made a wrong turn and ended up going someplace else, and they were separated for like eight or nine years. They met up again after the war. Now what was interesting is that the father had a deeper love and appreciation for the, for the son than the mother. Why? Mothers generally love their children more. It's because the father was in a position to give and care for that son for a lot longer than the mother did. Now generally speaking, I think mothers love their children more because they've given way more than their fathers. Just the, that's the nature of the relationships, right? But if you want to understand how to develop love, you have to create opportunities for the people around you to give to you. You think that love is about just doing for the other person. That's, that's true, it, there is, that's beautiful, but all that's gonna do is make you love them. So how do you create and generate love for the people around you? How do you get your spouse, boyfriend, children to learn to love you? By creating a space where they can do for you. And the more they can do for you, the more they will love you. How, does, how do you create that space? 
That's a very good question. So it depends on the nature of the relationship, the person, and so on and so forth. Right? Um, if you're super particular about how your floors are washed, right? And the and your guy says, no, I'll wash the floors. He's like, no, 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 it's okay, I'll do it, I'll do it because I want to do it my way. You lost an opportunity to give this other person the ability to love you. You understand? I mean, that, that's like a very random, I'm just, that's a personal example, you know, uh, in, my, in my own relationship. Like when we first got married, I was living in Israel, and I told my wife, let me do sponges. She's like, no, you, don't do, you won't do it as well as I do. But you still love her. I, I found, she found other ways for me to go ahead and, and love her, right? But I'm just saying like, that was, a, and I said this to her, I said like, this was a, a chiseron on your part. It was a, there was a lacking in your part. Like you should have allowed me, she regrets it. Not letting, not giving up control of that, what's it called? It's a very powerful thing. And for our children, by the way, this is also true for, for, for religion. You know how come most kids don't connect to Shabbat? We never give a space for our kids to give for Shabbat, to give to Shabbat. What are the kids doing to prepare for Shabbat? Are they making chalot? Are they buying the food for Shabbat? Are they cleaning for Shabbat? What are they doing to invest into the Shabbat experience? Right? How are they, how are they involved in building that feeling? Oh, it's Shabbat, it's Shabbat. We love Shabbat because we're constantly, the food, this, the whole week is about, oh my, how am I, who are we having, where are we going? We build that relationship because love is developed through the art of giving. You want your kids to love Shabbat? What are they doing for Shabbat? The maid's taking care of the table. Every kid in my family has a specific role they need to do for Shabbat. Even a small task like tearing toilet paper, so everyone has like torn toilet paper in all the bathrooms. Setting up the table, putting up the forks, putting up the knives, the plates, the cups, the tablecloth, the candles, everyone's gotta have a role. If you don't create spaces for the people around you to give to you or to invest in, right? You are not gonna allow, they're never gonna learn to love the things that you are involved in. Not you, not God, not anything. Because love, again, is developed, not by this, you know, quick glance of, oh, our eyes met when we fell in love. We don't believe in falling in love in Judaism. There's no word for romance in Judaism. You know how to say ro ro romantic in Hebrew? The, uh, you say romantica, but that's an English word. There's no word for romance in English. Because romance is a modern invention. It was invented in France in the 16th and 17th centuries. Jews didn't believe in romance. We believe in love. What's love? It's a choice. Are you willing to give to this person? Are you willing to commit to that person? That's what love is. All that other notions, love, romance, is a nonsense. Because if you want to boil it down, complete rational, remove all emotion from the whole entire thing. Bottom line is, we're a bunch of urges. What's motivating me? At the very base level, there's an urge. Why do I have an urge for certain things? Right? Well, God wants you to enjoy some of the things in the world, but he wants to motivate you to give. Right? He wants you to create a space where each of you can give to one another. There are urges that are there that help, come on, like push you along. You could do this. There's that urge. Go. Connect. And you see this in the next source over here. You see that a... Uh, let's, 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 let, we skipped a bunch of sources. This is definitely worth a read. Number 14. Rav Dessler says as follows. He would say this. With, he would tell this a chatanim and kalot on their wedding day. Right? He says, Filling your hearts at this moment is a wondrous desire to give pleasure and happiness to each other. Take care, my dear ones. Number 14, Abbasra. Take care, my dear ones, that you strive to keep this desire always as fresh and as strong as it is at its present time. You should know that the moment you find yourselves beginning instead to make demands upon each other, your happiness is at an end. You understand that last part? Right? When it switches and you are now only thinking about what this other person has not, what have you done for me lately? It's over. The true act of loving and building a, na a, a nurturing, loving relationship is two people that say, what can I do? How can I help? How can I give to you? And if you don't have it in the relationship, then what are you doing to create it and bring it into the relationship? 
Kohelet says, Oheb kesev lo yisba kesev. A lover of money never has his fill of money. Umi ohev behemon lo tavua. Gamze hevel. No, nor a lover of wealth will fill his income. When we have a desire for something, right? No matter, once that desire is there, no matter how much we fill it with something, it will, we're never satiated. Why is that? Why is that? Let's look at Sanhedrin for a minute. Let's look at the Gemara. Okay, this is a fascinating Gemara. Um, definitely a, a more of an evening Gemara than a morning Gemara. There's another one, there's two Gemara over here that are fascinating. We have like a little bit more here, we're almost finished. We're more than halfway there. Yehuda says, once David heard the nature of his, orde- of, of, uh, of his, or- his ordeal, right? And he, and he sought to prevent himself from experiencing lust. He felt an urge, right? So what did he do? He transformed his nighttime bed into his daytime bed. And Chachamim said he engaged in his intimate matters with his wives during the day, an attempt to quell his lust at night. So that at nighttime, he would not have as much passion, right? But, but there's a halacha. The Torah says that there is a small limb, right, that a man employs. And if he starves that limb, right, and does not overindulge, it is satiated. But if he satiates the limb and overindulges, it, indulges, he, it is starving. Why is that? Why is that the nature of man? Oh, this is, this is, this is, this is a, therefore, his plan had the opposite effect, right? When you starve something, right, you have a greater desire for it. When you satiate, when you, when you, sorry, when you satiate it, uh, you think that you're going to be satiated, but not. You have a greater desire. It has the opposite effect. Why is that? And this is this is a this is a cloud. He who has a hundred wants two hundred, and he who wants two hundred wants four hundred. When we want something, we have a desire, and we get that out. So when we have something that's a desire, it's it's why is it desirable? Because it's outside. It's out there. But once I take it, once I get it, I'm like, this is not enough. I, I need more. I need more and more and more and more. So then what's the right response to a desire? Right. And women are the same. Okay, the, the well, women are super different. Okay. But I don't think they're that similar. I don't think, I, I think it's the same. I think it's the same. I think it has to do with, I think it has to do with, but this, that's a much longer conversation. But yeah, I think, I think this is true for all desire. The difference is that for men, the things that men desire are generally super tangible things, right? They're usually very physical things. And for women, the things that they desire more are intangible things. I'm not saying they can't enjoy the physical things, but the, what they're looking for is a deeper connection, yeah. right? Men don't understand what that means. <laughs> it's like, they understand there's a concept called connectivity, whatever it is, but they're, the way in which they get there first is through external means. Okay, so if a man experiences that level of desire of, let's say, feeling like the union with his uh, significant other is the female, and they get that level of connection, why does he keep seeking that? It's more of because it's not, not built that way? Because yeah. He's looking for that? Yeah. That What's supposed to happen is that the base drives that we have are meant to to get us to think about what they're for, what they're, what's their real function, right? What's the real function of all those drives? So the halakha, we know that, that the whole idea of intimacy serves two roles. One, pururu, have children, multiply, be fruitful. And the second is onah, mitzvah of pleasing our spouses, right? And therefore you have this, this, this duality where on the one hand it's for this, for kids, and the other hand it's for pleasure. And then that pleasure is very broad. What does that mean for pleasure? Right? Is it just a physical kind of pleasure? Is it a spiritual kind of pleasure? Is it an emotional kind of pleasure? But all those things are meant to be developed and understood. As we develop ourselves, we hope that the things that we are pining for are not the same things we were pining for when we were in high school. (laughs) Right? And that we're supposed to evolve and grow and develop something bigger and better. But for most people, we get stuck in thinking of the primary... Um, desire is that urge itself and nothing beyond it. And that's the mistake that we make. Do you think all men know this or is it just men who study? No, I don't know. If, well, I don't know. If, well, most men don't know this. Don't know that most men important. are not in touch with why their emotions are there. They're not thinking about their drives. They think their drives define them. If I feel this way, it must be I need to have it. Who says that's true? Well, that's me. 
What's that? If I feel something, that means that is who I really am. That's not true. No, I mean, that's what the mindset is. Oh, that's what the mindset is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the mindset. That's me. And if you don't like it, take it or leave it. But that's not true. That's false. That we say that your, 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 your uh, emotions and drives do not define you. And the, the, the challenge that most men have is that, well, no, it's my drive. Therefore, no, it doesn't work like that. Part of it is learning to take control, to elevate that. And we see that, that, that David, David Amalek's attempt at doing that was, uh, it backfired. He, 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 he made a mistake. So suppressing for a man, what, what is the answer then? If suppressing the, it does not... The, the answer is, is like, the, I mean, we're going to get to it. We're going to get to it. But the answer we hear is that you first have to be satiated with what you have. If you feel that you're lacking is always a lack, and then once you get that, you're just gonna want more. That's not gonna help you. The answer is first, you have to be in a state where you actually appreciate the things that you have. Ezu Ashir, see at the end, Hasameach Bechelko. The wealthy person is the one who is Sameach Bechelko, who is happy. Ashrut, satiation, wealth, you have everything. If you feel unsatiated, right? If you're unhappy with what you have, there's no, nothing, nothing can satiate you. This is true for everything. Dieting, uh, it's true for all kinds of urges that we have. Who's in control of the urges? The urge, or are you? Right? Most of the time, we're eating for emotional reasons, not because we're hungry. We're not, we're not, we don't need to eat as much as we do. But we're always eating, 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 eating because we want the comfort of knowing that there's something in our bellies. <laughs> right? That's why most of us eat. Now, as we get older, we get wiser, we understand that now too much is bad and we have to rele relegate what we eat, we have to control how we eat, what we eat, where we eat. So we become somewhat methodical, right? But come on, every single time you see a nice ice cream, you're not saying, you don't like, oh, like, that's a nice ice cream, like, I want that ice cream. For me, my weakness is pizza. I love pizza. Cheese, sauce, and dough, for me, is like kryptonite. I can't say no. And but I know it's the worst thing for me. So yeah, a little bit. It's common for all the rabbis. You love pizza. You love pizza. Rabbis love pizza. Men, it's men. Men love pizza. It's a perfect food. Like, if it was healthy, I'd be eating it all day. Now you got the carbohydrates in the pizza. Too much. A little bit, a little bit. I don't, I mean, unfortunately, I don't work hard enough because I'm sitting down all day, I'm writing things, I'm typing things. Okay. If I was more active, you're right. If I was living a more active lifestyle, but I'm very, I'm, unfortunately, I'm sitting, I'm standing and sitting all day. I'm not really going anywhere. Okay. Gemara Nadarim says as follows. Gemara concludes that the final incident about a certain adulterer who entered the house of a certain married woman. This is a fascinating story, okay? So you have this, uh, this adulterer guy who comes to this woman's house and uh, the adulterer went and sat, right, when, when the man, the husband, came home, the adulterer went and sat himself behind the where he was hiding. So the husband would not know where he was. There was some uh, cress, which is, I guess, some kind of food that was lying in the house. And the adulterer, right, but not the husband, saw a snake that came and tasted of it. And maybe putting some of its venom inside of the food. So the, uh, the Balabai, the master of the house, wanted to eat from that cress without the woman's knowledge. The adulterer said to him, from out the door, hey, don't eat from that, that cress. A snake tasted it's poisonous. So now they brought this guy, this adulterer, you understand the case so far, right? They brought this adulterer before Rava, who said his wife is permitted to him, for if it were that the adulterer had committed a transgression, it would have been preferable for him that the husband would eat the cress and die. And therefore, even though he may have wanted to do adultery, he didn't do it, because if he really did it, he would have had the guy just die so he could go ahead and have whatever it is. So this is, this is a, okay. So that's the end of the Gemara over there. And it says, we quote, quote this pasuk in Yecheskel, for they have committed adultery and the blood is on their hands, indicating that adultery leads to murder. But that's not the case over here because the guy let the guy live. Okay, go to page four. Um, where's page four? Page four is, no, page five, right? So we say, now this is the problem. The problem is like this. We have a pasuk in Mishle that says, Maim gnuvim yimtaku, which means stolen waters are sweeter. Stolen waters are sweeter. Right? 
What does it mean that stolen waters are sweeter? You can't have something you enjoy more. Hundred percent. So if that's the case, then in the story that we just read, right, the person did not want the husband to die. Because if he was dead, then it wouldn't be stolen waters anymore. And therefore it was in his best interest to keep the guy alive. <coughs> that's the question of Tosfot. Who says that that's the right call on Rava? Right. Who says that was the right thing? Maybe it's Mayim Gedu Taku. Maybe this person kept the guy alive because he wanted this, the waters to be stolen. Right? God, I love the rabbis. Right? So let's look at, let's look at Tosafot for a minute. I mean, you don't want to keep her. You just want to have a thing in that Exactly. The person in the group of desire does not know that the impetus of his desire comes merely from the temporary unattainability of the, year, of, of the yearn for object. And then if only he were able to attain it without too much difficulty, it would lose all of its attraction. <coughs> he is convinced that his happiness depends on attaining this particular object, and if it would only achieve his goal, he would be happy ever after. If you only realize how diluted he was about this, he would soon cease his pursuit. This is true for every one of us, right? When we are, we believe that our happiness depends on this external thing, okay? Rabbi says no. I don't agree that uh, Mayim Gnu Taku because ultimately the bottom line is that um, he could have found somebody else. There could have been, you know, he, it wasn't, it wasn't a quite, if Mayim Gnu Mim Taku means that he would have already had that relationship and therefore he would know what he's missing. But therefore, since he allowed the guy to live, it means that he didn't do it and therefore it's, we can't use his prasuk of Mayim Gnu Mim Taku. That's how we reject, that's how we reject that answer. But <coughs> Toso's point <coughs> is that the impetus of his desire comes only from a temporary unattainability of a yearn for object. That's the issue. But we see Kohelet says, Hevel Havelim Omar Kohelet, right? Hevel Havelim Hakol Hevel, vanity, vanity, said Kohelet, vanity, vanity, is all is vanity. All external things ultimately have zero, zero depth to it. You want a bigger house? Have a bigger house? Okay. I got a bigger house, I got a small, like, that's not where your pleasure and happiness is gonna come from. It can't come from external objects. It's nice to have those things, have money, do things, amazing, but at the core, what you have has to be real. It can't be, which is what? Ezu Ashir HaSamech Bechalko. That is what we want. We want the next pasuk. That is the goal of the physical world. I've eaten and I'm satiated. What's the point of eating if you can't get satiated? A pig ne is never satiated. That's why they're called pigs. Chazir, always going chazara, is always going more. More and more and more and more and more, over and over and over again. God created pigs to clean up the earth. Now, for you and I, we have to ask ourselves ultimately like this. We went through this whole entire conversation about, you know, becoming a giver and thinking about giving, and we spoke, we had this whole conversation, a rational thinking about how love ultimately is a desire to give unconditionally. How do we become givers? How do we become lovers? So the first thing is recognizing that we're selfish. Don't think too highly of yourself. Everything that you do, number one, is motivated by selfishness, and that's okay. Number two, okay? Shalol lishma balishma, which means sometimes I do things without the right intention with the hope that it turns into the right intention. It's like fake it till you make it. No. Don't say fake it till you make it. You have to say fake it until you awake it. There's a difference, right? It's a subtle difference. Fake as you make it means that you never really change. You're gonna get there, but nothing changes with you. But the whole idea is to awake that inner part of who you are to become something bigger and better. You gotta fake it until you awake it. This is why we're here. God created humanity so that we could be in a state of giving, not in a state of chaos. The fact that we need the laws to protect us from eating each other up 
is a chisaron, not the world that God had created for us. If you were righteous, what could you give him? What does he receive from your hand? He receives nothing from your hand. A righteous person recognizes that God needs nothing. And therefore, if we want to emulate the divine, I'm, I'm, I went back to, to Eob, the first source where we started with, we have to become individuals that recognize that we need to become independent beings with the goal of hopefully finding a special person where we can become interdependent beings. That's what we're aiming for. What does the world look like if we become infinite givers? What happens to hunger? What happens to pain? What happens to suffering in the world? What happens to the stupid policies that all these governments create? What happens to all the social problems in our world today? They disappear. If you and I feel like Abraham did, this deep desire to give unconditionally, we bring Mashiach together. That is the avodah of this time of the year. As we're going to a place of darkness, a couple of weeks, we're changing the clock, there'll be more dark hours than there are light hours. It's so easy to kind of like pull yourself into your little home and lose yourself in a world of just caring for yourself and not thinking about others. The avodah now is to be in a place where you're starting to give and think about the world around you. Wishing you an amazing week. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. Thank you.